So what's the weather like in Texas? I know you get different weather patterns every two days. What's happening now? We are being blessed with the much needed rain. Good, good, good. And you, you and your family are doing well? Doing well. Wonderful, wonderful. Praise God. Praise, Praise God. God. Okay, okay. Um, well, we're glad to have so many of you on, and I, more will be coming on, and we have restarted the recording. And hey, Jackie Carter, the lovely Jackie Carter is with us tonight. Hey, Jackie Carter, come on and say hello. Hello. Cool. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Yeah, all right. I get, all right. I get to have dinner with you later on, don't I? You bet. All right. Cool, man. Cool. All right, now. Okay. Jackie will be uh, handling the chat window and ministering through the chat window. So glad, always glad to have Jackie with us and to assist with this great ministry. Um, we're looking at lesson number three tonight of our course, uh, Back to Basics 126, the Old Testament books of history, part one. So this covers, this course covers um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. So we're getting ready to go into lesson three tonight. And it's a great lesson. Let's open up with prayer. Uh, Jackie, would you open us up with prayer, please? Certainly. Father God, we thank you for the gift of another day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather again by way of technology to study your word so that we may increase in wisdom and in knowledge. And not only that, so that we will be able to be better ambassadors as we share what we learn with others. We thank you now for each individual who has gathered. We ask a blessing upon the individual as well as the household. We thank you for our teacher, and we thank you for the wisdom that you give to him to share with us. And we ask that you bless those who are a part of this ministry but have not joined us yet, that they will be able to come and to join in this study and this fellowship with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. I appreciate that, and appreciate you leading us in prayer. And we thank God for answering prayer and blessing his people. God continues to pour out his blessings upon us, and we are so wonderfully blessed by our Lord. Before we go into our lesson, I want everybody, those of you in the chat window who can, and I uh, want everybody to give a special shout-out tonight to Karen Herzog. To Karen Herzog. Karen's on with us. Karen just completed today her bachelor's degree in the Back to Basic School of Ministry. So everybody just take a little bit of time. You can unmute your phone and, or go into the chat window and give a shout out to Karen and uh, congratulate her on earning her bachelor's degree. Congratulations, Karen. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Okay. Hey, um, I see people in, in the chat window congratulating Karen. Good. And Karen has worked very hard, and, you know, she earned her bachelor's degree quickly. Uh, she's on a roll, and so we want to congratulate her for setting a pace, and she's on a pace. And now um, the course she's currently taking will be her first, is her first course towards her master's degree. And so we want to encourage you, if you're in a degree program, to stick with it, hang in there with it. Um, and if you know people who want to earn a degree, have them get in touch with us. Um, and for those who do not choose to go for a degree but want to go along for the studies, I believe this Back to Basics online Bible study is awesome. It's anointed by the Lord and people are growing, and I'm just excited. I love teaching the Word, and I thank God for the opportunity uh, uh, that you and I, we can grow together. So open your Bibles or download Judges, chapter 1 of the book of Judges, and we discover that 
the book of Judges begins with the death of Joshua. Uh, after Joshua died and after his uh, colleagues died, and hardly anyone uh, uh, remembered Joshua anymore, and they didn't keep the uh, commandments, and Israel went into um, backsliding. And the book of Judges is all about, it's a cycle, a vicious cycle of ups and downs, ups and downs. And one of the themes of the book of Judges is every man did that which was right in his own sight. Okay? They did not obey God's laws. They turned against God. They did what was right in their own sight. Kind of similar to what's happening in America today. Every person doing what they feel like doing, and 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 uh, even even in the church, the church today, uh, people doing what they feel like doing rather than honoring God. Ladies and gentlemen, it pays to obey God. It pays to obey God. So we must continue to pray for uh, not only this nation but the nations, and pray for our families, loved ones, even our enemies, that people obey God. The theme for our online church this year is, let this be the year of our return to the Lord. Let this be the year. Let 2020 be the year of our return to the Lord. We're talking about the nation. We're talking about nations. We're talking about individuals. We're talking about churches. We're tr talking about uh, Christians. We're, let this be the year that we repent of our sins and return to worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth and in obedience to him. And, and I love uh, studying the Old Testament because the Old Testament lets us see a lot of the uh, pitfalls that God's people fell into. And we also see that God is, is a righteous judge. God will not put up with sin. He will not tolerate sin. And as we look at the Old Testament, we see nations who got away with sinning against God for long periods of time. And there are people today uh, who are tempting God and think they're getting away with, with sin. People say anything they want to say. They do anything they want to do. And they think uh, uh, God is not going to remember this and God will not punish. But God is a just God. He hates sin. He loves people, but he hates sin. And so we can learn a lot by studying <coughs> the Bible, and particularly studying the Old Testament. So let's start with uh, Judges uh, chapter 1, and uh, let me just review, re, um, reduce a little bit of my volume. Okay, we're starting with uh, Judges chapter 1. We want to welcome you, Dr. Gene Bratton, with us tonight. Praise God, the wonderful pastor of the Living Water Ministries in Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, an assistant uh, instructor in the online uh, um, Bible study. We welcome her. Okay, so Judges, when we look at Judges, uh, chapter 1 is all about Canaanite strongholds. Canaanite strongholds. Judges is all about the fact that even with the distribution of the land in Joshua, there were still Canaanite strongholds. There were still territories that needed to be defeated by the Israelites. Chapter 2, the themes in Chapter 2 are thorns in your sides and idol worshipers. Thorns in your sides and idol worshipers. In Chapter 3, we see Othniel's leadership. We met Othniel in, in um, Joshua Chapter 15. Othniel was the son-in-law of Caleb. You remember Caleb said when they went to uh, um, Kirjath Arba to fight against the giants, Othniel said, I will give my daughter in marriage to wh whoever destroys this city and defeats, these, defeats the enemy. And Othniel, who happened to be Caleb's nephew, he was the son of Caleb's youngest brother, Othniel took the leadership and defeated the giants. And Othniel married Caleb's daughter. We also see in chapter 3, Ehud slays Eglon. Now you'll say, well, who is Ehud and who is 
Eglon. We'll meet them in chapter 3. Chapter 4 of Judges, Deborah and Barak. Deborah and Barak. Uh, two great people. Deborah, uh, a woman judge. Uh, a woman judge. She, was, she was, uh, was a powerful leader. We also see Jabin's defeat. Jabin's defeat. And then uh, I'm adding another theme in Judges chapter 4. And that theme is called, is, is, is entitled, Don't Drink Jail's Milk. <laughs> Don't Drink Jail's Milk. Hey, you, hey, guys, you be careful who offers you a glass of milk. We'll see that in chapter 4. Don't Drink <laughs> Jail's Milk. Chapter 5, Deborah's Song of Victory. Deborah's Song of Victory. Chapter 6, The Rise of Midian. And then God Sends a Prophet. And then we see Gideon's altar. Gideon committed a sin in chapter 6. He built an altar. Uh, uh, he, <clears throat> he built, uh, I'm sorry, he destroyed, he destroyed altars. But then later on we see Gideon, uh, he, built, he has an ephod made, uh, a, a, a breastplate made for himself out of, out of gold. And that was a sin. Um, chapter 7 we see that there are 300 left. Um, you will see 300, 300 what? 300 people. Uh, God reduced an army of 30,000 people down to 300 and told Gideon, now you, you're ready to go into battle with 300 people. Uh, we see the importance of pitchers and lamps or pitchers and lanterns in chapter 7. Chapter 8 of Judges, the refusal of help, the refusal of help, where um, Gideon, after a great victory, is reprimanded by the other tribes because they said, you didn't let us help you win the battle. Uh, we see Gideon's victories in chapter 8. Then chapter 9 of Judges, Abimelech's plot. Abimelech, Abimelech is the son of Gideon, and uh, Abimelech plotted and took over the kingdom, and we see what happened to him. We see Jotham's parable. We see Gael's rebellion, G-A-A-L, Gael's rebellion, and then we see the death of Abimelech. And so we see a lot of treachery going on in the book of Joshua. We see a lot of treachery that took place in the Old Testament. And, ladies and gentlemen, we see a lot of treachery in families. Families did not get along. And, and so one of the themes of, of the book of Judges is every man did that which was right in his own sight. Okay, whatever they felt like doing, that's what they did. And, and most people in the book of Judges, dishonored God. We see another recurrent theme in the book of Judges, and that, that is this. Whenever Israel turned their, their backs against God, and whenever they sinned against God and started worshiping idols, worshiping Baal, worshiping Ashtoreth, and other idols, God caused an army to come up and overtake Israel. And then after Israel repented, God would raise up a judge. So the judge was that person whom God raised up to lead Israel against the enemy and to deliver Israel from the enemy, and then that judge would rule Israel. And so that theme is throughout the, the book of Judges. In chapter 10, we see various judges. Chapter 11, we see Jephthah, a judge, a famous judge named Jephthah. He was chosen. And then uh, uh, in, in, the, in the choice of Jephthah, we see uh, uh, one who was, who was denounced by the people. They didn't like him. They didn't want him. They didn't love him. He was, he was a, a, a bastard son, and, and his family didn't like him. They kicked him out. And so he was the, the black sheep of the family. And, uh, and then, but when war came, when war came and they could not find another champion, another general to lead them into battle, they all uh, 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 came and, and asked Jephthah to lead them in the battle, the one they despised. And, um, um, you know, so, so you, 
we see even in our lives today, those who are despised, when, when crunch time comes, uh, people know how to uh, call on the despised for help. And, 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 and there are some of you. Uh, we, each of us, we've been despised by others, but let somebody get uh, afflicted with cancer or, or, or lose all their funds. And, and even in our families, those who despise us and reject us, they know how to come to us when they need prayer, when they need help, when they need assistance. I wonder, can I get a witness in the chat room out there? Thanks, Gene Bratton. Chapter 11. We also see that's so true. Hallelujah! True. You go now. Jephthah made a vow, ladies and gentlemen. Vows are important. Vows are important. And uh, I preached about vows on last Sunday on the online church and um, the importance of uh, carrying out these oaths that we make unto God. Okay. Um, and our wedding vows are important. When we stand before God and that audience and, 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 and make these vows, these are holy vows unto the Lord. And so uh, if, 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 you, if you have had a bad marriage and, and, or having a bad marriage, I want you to go to uh, the YouTube or go on my website and look at that uh, message from last Sunday because if you're if, if 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 you've disobeyed God, then there's a way to get out and to get delivered from uh, uh, God's wrath. Okay, all marriages do not work out, but um, there's a way to get delivered, uh, even if you've been in a bad marriage. So t follow those instructions. Um, we talked on Sunday about the importance of honoring those vows that we make. Um, uh, even, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, it's happening right now. It's happening right now. One of the main reasons why God gave me the message for last Sunday um, is was to expose the hypocrisy in this nation, not only in marriages and in families and in relationships, but people will swear. They will swear on the Bible. Uh, they put their left hand on the Bible and raise their right hand to God and, and swear. And so we've had this done this week. And as I mentioned in the message on Sunday, I said on Tuesday, there will be 101 leaders in America who will individually place their left hand on the Bible and raise their right hand and swear unto God that they're going to uphold the Constitution and tell the truth. And, and, and I also said on Sunday uh, about 50% of them are, are going to be lying. And, and uh, the others may be lying. And, and the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court may be lying. And so we're going to witness this week how this thing turns out. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in difficult times, and, and we've got leaders who will place their left hand on the Bible. And some of you have gone to court. You place your left hand on the Bible. And, and, but, and, and there are lawyers who train people how to lie. They know how to spin a lie. Ladies and gentlemen, do you think God is pleased? This is my question. It was my question in that powerful sermon on Sunday. It's my question concerning marriages. It's my question concerning relationships. Do you think God is pleased when we either put our left hand on the Bible and raise our right hand unto God and swear we do solemnly swear to uphold, uh, we do solemnly swear, or when we stand at the altar and, and swear and make a pledge, a vow before God Almighty, I, I promise to, to love and to cherish, to have and to hold for uh, better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, uh, till death do us part. These are holy vows, ladies and gentlemen. And if you've uh, taken an holy vow and, 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 okay, your marriage didn't work out or your relationship didn't work out, please, I beg you, go to my YouTube channel, uh, go to the website, and look at that, <coughs> that message again. By the way, now I'm recounting. I did not put that message on the website on Sunday, but it will be on the front page, the first page of the website tomorrow. And you'll see it on the website on the page entitled The Online Church. Please look at that. 
Please look at that because there are people who need to be delivered and, 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 and we don't want anything being held against us in our relationship with God and even our relationships with other people. I'm saying all this. I walk way out there, Dr. Gene Bratton. I walk way out there in that deep water uh, not to offend anybody. And if I did offend anybody, I hope I offended you to the place where you go and look at the, 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 the uh, uh, recording and repent and, and, and make whatever adjustments you have to make, whether it's in your marriage or my marriage or whether it's in the nation or whether it's in our relationship with others. You know, God exposes these things so that we can repent. Look at, Je we're going to look at Jephthah. Jephthah made a vow, ladies and gentlemen, and a vow, a promise. Uh, the things we say out of our mouths, God is going to hold us accountable for every word that proceeds out of our mouths. And um, we need to read Matthew chapter 11, verses 31 to 37, where it talks about the tree. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And uh, uh, many of our, our leaders today, our senators right now, who are debating on the floor right now, they need to look at the fact that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. There are liars. They are paid by the American public. They are voted into office by the American public. But these men and women make these vows and promises. They put a, their hand on the Bible and the right hand to God, but they will lie. They will lie to, to support their political party agenda. They will lie. They will lie to support whatever agenda is, is, is uh, controlling them, and many of them are in the pockets of politicians. Ladies and gentlemen, America is in difficult shape. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not focusing on this uh, uh, impeachment trial this week. I'm focusing on, and the Lord has me focus on what's going to happen after the trial is over. After the trial, there's going to be a need for men and women of God to stand up and be counted for Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, I, have, I don't think the church has any clue. I don't think the church has any clue tonight about how important it is for you and me to stand on the word of God, not on uh, uh, the word of, 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 of our political leaders or uh, the word of our bosses or those who write our paychecks. Uh, 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 and even, even in households, husbands and wives are going to have to stand on the word of God, not on some emotional uh, relationship, but on the word of God, because difficult times, ladies and gentlemen, the dark clouds are rising, and difficult times are, are, are coming uh, uh, to America. So uh, don't join any celebration this week or whenever this trial is over. Don't join any celebration, any political celebration. I'm, I'm urging you right now, don't join in any celebration because uh, uh, this, whoever wins this, this uh, court case, this uh, decision, uh, it's, a, it's not a win-win situation for America because the difficult times are on the horizon. I'm saying this because I walked way out there uh, when, when, when I mentioned that chapter 11, uh, one of the themes in there is the vow, Jethro's vow. He made a vow before the Lord. He made a promise before God. And ladies and gentlemen, what he promised God, was, 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 is, when you look at it, it was stupid. It was dumb. He shouldn't have had, had said it. But the thing is, he was a man of his word. And ladies and gentlemen, people say a lot of dumb stuff. We let dumb stuff come out of our word, our mouths. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we've got to be careful what comes out of our mouths. We've got to be careful uh, um, about what we say, we are accountable for every every word. When you would read Matthew chapter 12, chapter, what I say, 11, cha Matthew chapter 12, 31 to 37, 12, 31 to 37. When you get around verses 35, 36, 37, you'll see that every idle word that comes out of our mouth, we've got to give an account for it. And so be careful. We need to learn how to zip our lips. We need to know how to be quiet. We need to learn how to be humble. We need to know how to keep our opinion to ourselves. It's the word of God because God is going to hold us accountable for every promise we make, every word that comes 
out of out of our mouths. And uh, like I was sharing with Jackie uh, the other day, one of my favorite songs when I was in high school. It was a song by the Skyliners. It was a song by the Skyliners, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about a vow and a promise. The song was entitled, now none of you are old enough to remember this, but the song was entitled, This I Swear. And the song went something like this. My love for you will last till time itself is through. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, this I swear is true. My lips will kiss, I vow, nobody else but you. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, this I swear is true. Now, Ryan, I know this is deep. Keep your hand on the steering wheel as you drive, Ryan. This is deep. Uh, you, okay, you go home and tell Miss Tara this, and you know you, you're in like Flint. But this song, this song, I, I told Jackie about this song because, you know, like a lot of guys, we would copy the words of that song, and we'd say it to our girlfriend, uh, uh, Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, this I swear is true. And then it goes on to tell, I promise you that I will never make you cry. This love will be eternally cross my heart and hope to die. And, and ladies and gentlemen, it was all about swearing to love that particular person. And, and, and back in my senior year in high school, and most of the guys, it was, it was loving the one you were with, you know, the girl of the month. Most guys had the girl of the month. Or the girl of the two months, you know, and but we made promises, and then a lot of guys went off and got married, married their high school sweethearts, and and a lot of those marriages did not work out. But be careful what you swear. I know that song; uh, that was a good song, good singing. And uh, but if you want to really hear that song in its entirety, Google or go on YouTube and look at. Look at, for a song called This I Swear by the Skyliners. The Skyliners. They were from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A real, real, real doo-wop song. And, um, but, but the point is we're responsible for every word that comes out of our mouths. I'm responsible for every word that's ever proceeded out of my mouth. And, and you are too. And our leaders today are. And so the Bible teaches us don't let any corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths. We're not to lie on people. We're not to deceive people. We're not to be perpetrators. We're not to uh, scandalize anyone. We have to be responsible for the words that come out of our mouths. Even, even uh, young men, Ryan, uh, Brian, Brian is single. Brian, you can be careful what you say to that young lady. You know, be careful what you say. Not messing with you. Not getting in your business, Brian. But you be careful, okay, what you say. And then chapter 12 of uh, Judges, all about the defeat of Ephraim. Okay, when you look at chapter 1, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first? to fight against them. And so they still had their assignments. They had to win these battles. The Canaanites were not going to give up this land. God gave the land to them, but the Canaanites said, we ain't giving it up. And even to this day, the Canaanites still do not want to give up that land. And, the, and so they said, who will lead us into battle? What tribe is going to lead us into battle? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And so we had several, a uh, 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 couple months ago in a previous class, we showed you the marching order of the tribes of Israel as they would leave, as, as the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant would be carried, and then the tribes marched in their order. And Judah was the very first tribe to go out and to lead um the, the Canaanites into battle. And then when you look back at what we learn in Joshua, um, because 
Gad and Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh had settled on the east bank of the Jordan. Moses told Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh that whenever you go into battle, you'll be the first tribe to lead in the battle against uh, the enemy in the, in the new land. And so the Lord said in chapter in verse 2, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me unto my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And so the tribes organized to fight against uh, the enemies. Okay, uh, verse 8, Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the sword, edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. And so uh, we see Judah fighting against the Canaanites. Verse 12, And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjah Sefer, and taketh it to him, will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, the, the, his daughter, to wife. So Aksa becomes one of the early judges of, of Israel. Aksa, um, and Othniel became one of the earlier judges of Israel. He was not the first. In fact, the first judge was actually um, Samuel. Samuel, uh, the uh, the first the, the first real judge of Israel. Okay, um, now I'm going to back up on that. I'm going to back up on that. No, no, the last judge of Israel. Thank you. The last judge of Israel was Samuel, but Othniel was one of the first judges. Okay, uh, verse twenty. Uh, verse uh, 20, and they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Caleb had promised in, Judge, in Joshua chapter 14, when Moses was distributing the land, he said, Moses, give me this mountain. Give me Hebron. When we spied out this land 45 years ago, I noticed that the giants, the sons of Anak, lived there, and, and they're still entrenched. And give me this mountain. I'll drive them out. And so Caleb, along with Othniel, his future son-in-law, went into war, and they drove out the giants out of that particular land. Let's go over to Judges chapter 2. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. And so between the time of, of the angel of the Lord coming up and speaking what I, we just read, uh, Israel had won some battles, but then they backslid again. And then so uh, God calls uh, the enemy to come, uh, come up and inhabit them and take over. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore I also said I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord and he, that he did for Israel. So in the first couple of chapters, you're seeing a, a, a summary of the history of uh, including uh, the work of Joshua in leading uh, the people. Verse 12 of chapter 2, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, and the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. 
Verse 13, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. You know, not only did they worship Baal and Ashtaroth, but Baal was the so-called god of fertility. And, and uh, Ashtaroth was the so-called goddess of fertility. Uh, the statues that they had of Baal and Ashtaroth were uh, 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 shaped like sex symbols, ladies and gentlemen. And they had... Uh, heavy sex orgies and and I mean I mean the what they did uh, at these groves of Baal and Ashtoreth were uh, an abomination against the Lord. Verse fourteen, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and He delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. So throughout the book of Judges, you'll see Israel re rebelling against the Lord, sinning against the Lord, and and and. and uh, affixing themselves uh, with Baal and Ashtoreth and worshiping uh, idols. And, and yet, when they cried out unto the Lord, the Lord would raise up a judge, someone to deliver them. Verse 17, And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was the, with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. And it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. God is not pleased when his people suffer. God is not pleased when, when people are, 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 are imprisoned, when people are oppressed by others. And yet God allows imprisonment. God allows uh, oppression. God even allows death and destruction. My heart went out this week uh, to this, man, this pastor in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Uh, um, the church doesn't really hear about what's going on. Uh, in, in, in foreign lands, but there are a lot of things happening in foreign nations. Uh, these days, the church is so politically inclined uh, that we, we don't even hear what's going on in other, in other nations. Ladies and gentlemen, there are nations that where Christians are being beheaded because of their love for Jesus Christ. Uh, in African nations, in Asian nations, in many of these Arabic nations, uh, People are beheaded. People are being beheaded for uh, uh, loving the Lord God Almighty. And uh, in Nigeria, a pastor was just put to death this past weekend because the Islamics, the Boko Haram, the Boko Haram uh, captured him and, 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 and tortured him and said, now, denounce Jesus Christ, denounce Jesus Christ. And this pastor did not denounce Jesus Christ. He said, I refuse to denounce Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my Savior, my Lord, my God, and my King. And they cut his head off, ladies and gentlemen. And, and uh, Christians in America, we've got it easy. We've got it easy. We, we don't think this can happen to America. But ladies and gentlemen, it's a wake-up call. It should be a wake-up call for America. We have a responsibility to pray for Christians all over the world. There are brothers and sisters, members of the body of Christ, of all colors, of all nationalities all over the world, and many are suffering because of their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this nation, you can barely get people to go to church two Sundays in a row. You can barely get people to really commit uh, to the Word of God. You can barely get people to, to, to humble themselves and, and, and ask God to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And you can barely get people to commit to serve the Lord with all their hearts, whereas in other nations, people are dying, ladies and gentlemen. They're put, being put to death because 
of their affiliation with Jesus Christ. There are people in, in, in many countries where their churches are being burned down. Their houses are being burned down because of their love for Jesus Christ. And yet, in the United States of, of America, we are so comfortable. We're so comfortable. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to wake up and smell the coffee. Verse 19, and when it and it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. Ladies and gentlemen, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing signs of this in America where uh, church leaders, pastors, Whole entire congregations are bowing down and worshiping these political leaders. It's time for a wake-up call, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter 3 of Judges. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, uh, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So there were nations that God left in Canaan land, to prove Israel. God wanted to prove Israel to see if they would carry out his instructions. And so at the death of Joshua, there were a lot of nations that still were intact and their cities were still strongholds. And yet much, many of the tribes of Israel did not fulfill their responsibilities and drive out the nations. And so what they did was to let uh, uh, enemy, the enemy nations live even in their cities and they charge them a tribute. In other words, the people had to work for them, uh, sort of like being slaves to the Israelites and also uh, providing a certain amount of finances on a yearly basis and then Israel let them live and didn't kill them. Okay? And so this all came, this all came back on Israel as we see during the uh, book of Judges. Verse 8, Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Shushan Rishathaim. Wow, what a, what a name. What's your name, man? Hey, what's your name? My name is Shushan Rishathaim. That's in verse 8. Shushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. <laughs> and the children of Israel served Shushan Rishathaim eight years. So God let Chushan Rithathaim rise up and conquer Israel. And Israel became his servants for eight years. Verse 9, we're in chapter 3 of Judges. And when the, Lord, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. So we see Othniel. Othniel became the judge, and he led them into battle and delivered Israel. Okay, and so, verse 12, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, after Othniel led them. Okay, Othniel led them for 40 years. After 40 years, Israel sinned again. And, verse 12, And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 13, And he gathered unto them the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. So there were 18 years of bondage after the death of Othniel, because the people forgot about God. And so, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a man left-handed. He was a lefty. And by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. And it turned out that this left-handed deliverer named Ehud went to the king uh, of Moab. And the king of Moab was a big old, big, heavy set, big, fat guy. And so uh, Ehud, Ehud hid a, a dagger in, in, on, an, on a holster in his, on his thigh. And so when he went into to the king and uh, when he had a private time with the king, he pulled out that dagger and 
punched him in his gut with it. And actually, uh, the Bible says the man was so so fat that the the fat sucked up the whole, the handle of the of the uh, of the dagger and dirt, meaning blood and and pus and dirt, all gushed out. And so Eglon was killed, and then. Ehud was able to escape, verse 26, and Ehud escaped while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped unto Seiroth. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount and he before them. Whenever a leader would call Israel to to battle or call them to an assembly, he would blow a trumpet on the mountain and all the men would come out. Verse 28, and he said unto them, follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was to subdue that day under the, land, under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. And after him was Shamgar, Shamgar, verse 31. And after uh, him was Shamgar, after Ehud was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox gold, and he also delivered Israel. Shamgar was a bad man, uh, Brian. Shamgar took an ox gold. Now, that was a pole with a piece of, uh, like a metal spear on the end that they used to prod the oxen when the oxen were slow and didn't want to move. Uh, Shamgar took an, an ox gold and killed 600 Philistines. Chapter 4, we see Deborah and Barak. Deborah, a woman leader, a woman uh, judge. Verse 4, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, she judged Israel at that time. Okay, and, and we find that Israel had, had done evil again in the sight of the Lord. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So we see a woman judge in Israel. And so uh, they needed to go into battle against the enemy. And they called on Deborah. Deborah was a bad sister. Verse 10, And Barak called Zebulon and Nephtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Let's go back to verse 8. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. You know, Deborah must have been bad, ladies and gentlemen. She must have been a bad sister because Barak said, Hey, if you go into battle with me, I'll go. But if you won't go into battle, I ain't going. So Deborah went, okay, and, um, so, and they, won, they, they, they won the battle. Verse 12, and they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him. Verse 14, and Deborah said unto Barak, up, up. She didn't have to say, rise up, it's time to fight. <clears throat> she said, up. For this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord going out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak so that Sisera lighted off from his chariot and fled away on his feet. I mean, the Israelites put a hurting. They put a hurting on the enemy, and Sisera, the leader, uh, uh, jumped off his chariot and started running on, on, on foot, okay? But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host. Howbeit, verse 17, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, 
the king of Hazor, and the house of Eber, Heber the Canaanite. So here's the scene. Deborah and Barak lead Israel into battle, and they defeat the enemy. And Sisera, the leading general of the enemy, uh, 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 jumped off his chariot and tried to run and hide, okay, on foot so he could escape Deborah and Barak, okay. But he made a big mistake, ladies and gentlemen. He made a big mistake. Now, he ran to the house of a woman whose husband was a leader among the Canaanites, and the Canaanites and this man's uh, people were not enemies, but he ran to this house, and the wife's name was J.L., and I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the themes of the book of Judges is don't drink JL's milk. Don't, hey, hey, guys, be careful who offers you a glass of milk. Listen to this, verse 18 of chapter 4. Now, J and JL went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me. In other words, come on, you can, you can hide here. Fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, <coughs> she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk. Ladies and gentlemen, she opened a bottle of Borden's milk and gave him drink and covered him. She gave him some milk to drink, and then she put a rug over him. But look at verse 20. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent. And it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man there that thou shalt say no? I mean, this guy was scared. This dude was scared, man. He was running for his life. Then J.L., Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand. Hey, uh, co-pastor Lisa Johnson, she took a nail and a hammer. Watch out for a woman with a nail and a hammer, brothers. And went softly <laughs> unto him and smote the nail into his temples. Look here, ladies and gentlemen. She took that let nail with a spike, and she took a hammer, and she drove that spike into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. Woo! You may say, Pastor Cody, you sound like you're getting a big kick reading in this. I am. I am. I love the book of Judges. I love it, ladies and gentlemen. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said, and said unto him, Come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temple. Ladies and gentlemen, she pinned, <laughs> she pinned his head to the ground. <laughs> be careful, guys. Be careful, guys. Don't drink everybody's milk. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. Okay, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. Then chapter 5 is all about Deborah's song as Deborah rehearsed the events of, of that war and uh, that, a, great, a great song as she sang uh, unto the Lord about God's blessings. Chapter 6 of Judges, and the children of Israel, yep, 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 did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's the recurring theme. They won a victory. They served God for a while, but then they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Okay? And so this brings us to uh, uh, Gideon. Uh, Gideon comes on the scene uh, God sent an angel to him, and there came an angel. Verse 11, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abbi Ezrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine price, wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon was <coughs> working with his daddy near the wine press, trying to thresh wheat and to hide the wheat from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. I can imagine Gideon, when the angel said, Thy mighty man of valor, Gideon's looking around. Who, who, who's he talking about? Uh, and Gideon said unto the Lord, said unto him, O my Lord, 
If the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So the angel called Gideon a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, Hey, hey, all contraire, I, I, I beg, I beg of thee, if the Lord's with us, why are we living the way we are? Why are we? Why am I hiding, hiding grain behind, behind the wine press? Why are we oppressed by the Midianites? And so, verse 14, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And like many of us who are called by the Lord, the Lord calls us. He gives us a vision. He tells us what he wants us to do. He outlines to us, gives us a, a glimpse of what the ministry, ministry is going to be like. And we rejoice. We shout and all this. But then the next day, when we think this thing of, oh, whoa, 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 God, whoa, back up, God. I mean, God, how am I going to do this? I ain't got no money. I'm broke, busted, and disgusted. I'm the black sheep of my family. People don't even speak to me anymore. And you want me to be a leader? You want me to have a, a great ministry? How? I mean, Gideon goes through all this. And then Gideon puts out a fleece and, and tells God, show me a sign that thou talkest with me, verse 17. And, and then Gideon goes and kills a goat and prepares it and serves the angel of the Lord a meal. And, uh, and then uh, the angel of the Lord performs a miracle. Uh, verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and unleavened cakes, and there rose up from fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out, out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto you, to thee. Shalom alachem. Fear not, thou shalt not die. Okay? And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet an opera of the Abbi Ezraites. The Lord our peace. Jehovah Shalom. So, um... Gideon is called. Chapter 7, uh, Gideon's name is changed to Jerubbael, Jerubbael because he pulled down the uh, idols of Baal that his father worshipped, and they renamed him Jerubbael. And then Gideon goes into battle, and um, before he goes into battle, he stands on the mountain and blows the trumpet. Verse 7, he blows the trumpet, and all of Israel gathers unto Gideon, and uh, they know that the hand of the Lord is upon Gideon, and Gideon calls them to get ready for battle. But they had 30,000 men show up, and God said, whoa, 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 back up, Gideon. Well, I can't give you a victory with 30,000 men, because they would think they won it on their own. And that's a message to us, ladies and gentlemen. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Uh, we God calls us, calls us to ministry, calls us to a task, and we want to know all the details. God's not going to give us all the details. He wants us to walk by faith. When he promises victory, he'll give the victory, but walk by faith. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think. When the deal came down, God showed Gideon a method, a way to, to choose the ones who would fight in his army. And uh, those who got down on their knees and lapped lap, lap water uh, uh, like, in their hand like a dog uh, compared to those who got down on both knees and put their faces in the water, choose the ones who, who, were, who were alert while they lapped. And Gideon wound up with 300 men out of 30,000. He sent the rest of them home, and he took 300 men with 300 lanterns and 300 clay jars, and, and 300 horns, and said, um, at a certain point, when you hear me uh, uh, blow my horn, then you break your, lant break your clay vessel, and uh, take out your lantern, and wave that lantern, and blow your horn, 
And so all around, they surrounded the, uh, the Midianite army. And when uh, Gideon blew his horn, and then the others followed in suit, the uh, enemy was so, so confused, they actually wound up killing themselves. They panicked. Panic, ladies and gentlemen. God has used panic to, to win many a war for his <laughs> people. Okay. And so we could go on and on. I want to get to... Uh, Jephthah, let's go over to chapter 11. Chapter 11, you read this assignment for yourself, but in chapter 11, Jephthah, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Jephthah the Gideonite was a mighty man of valor. He was the son of a harlot, and, and Gilead begat Jephthah. His brothers and sisters hated him because their mother was a whore. And uh, the other brothers and sisters were the products of a of a of a uh, husband and wife marriage, but Gideon's mother was a whore, and so they ostracized him. In fact, they kicked him out of the village. But yeah. when the deal went down, when the Midianites came back, when the enemy came back, they called on Jephthah uh, to lead them into battle. Okay, and Jephthah made. A vow okay he made a vow and verse 30 listen carefully to this and Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hand I mentioned it Mid Midian but was the An Ammonites then it shall be that who whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if he was thinking about his dog, his favorite pit bull, or his cat, or his pet goat, or his pet ox, or his pet cow. But I don't think when Jephthah made that vow, ladies and gentlemen, he realized that his daughter was going to be the first thing out the door to greet her daddy when daddy came back from war. So Jephthah led Israel into war. Israel won the war. And when he got home, the first thing that came out of his house to greet him was not his pet pit bull, not his pet cat, not his pet ox, not his pet goat, but his daughter. And Jephthah had vowed, ladies and gentlemen, he had promised to sacrifice whatever came out of his house first. He would give it to the Lord if the Lord had given him that battle. And God gave Jephthah the battle. And, and uh, verse 30, and Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. Ladies and gentlemen, he made a vow to the Lord, and he could not undo that vow. Be careful what you promise God. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. We're responsible for every word that proceeds out of our mouths. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouths. And I say to those, those 100 senators who are debating this week and the chief justice of the Supreme Court, you put your left hand on the Bible and you raise your right hand unto God and you swore to tell the truth and uphold the Constitution. You are in the presence of God, leaders. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I have to be very careful what we say. Jephthah promised to sacrifice his daughter unto the Lord. He promised to sacrifice whatever came out of his house first. It happened that his daughter came out. She was a virgin, never known a man. <clears throat> and she... And he told her the promise he made, and she said, well, whatever vow you made to the Lord, you must fulfill your vow. And she accepted the fact that as a virgin, she would never know a man. She would never uh, uh, grow to, to enjoy marriage and old age. 
and she asked her father to allow her with her handmaidens to go up into the mountains for a couple months and bewail her virginity and to cry unto the Lord. And when she came back, uh, that she, w she would offer herself unto her father to be put to death, ladies and gentlemen. And Jephthah carried out the promise that he made to the Lord. You may say, well, that was a dumb vow. He didn't have to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the promises we make to the Lord are promises. Some of them are dumb. Be careful what you promise God. God hears every word that proceeds out of our mouths. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. It's in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. It's deep. It's deep. Okay. And verses, uh, verse 12 uh, read verse, uh, cha I'm sorry, chapter 12, about the defeat of Ephraim. The defeat of Ephraim. Uh, one of the tribes of Israel uh, went into defeat, and God judged them with defeat because of their iniquity. Okay, verse 7, uh, Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite. And he was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Okay, that's as far as we'll go uh, this week. We'll continue with this exciting journey through the book of Judges next week when we look at uh, the rest of the book of Judges, uh, chapters 13 through 21. What an exciting book. What an exciting book. And I'm so glad to have the opportunity uh, to to uh, minister the word. Uh, somebody asked, was it a physical death or a commitment to serve the Lord, serve God? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he promised he would sacrifice. He made a sacrifice, and God did not require that sacrifice. He did not require that she be put to death. No, it was not a commitment to serve God. He made a promise to make a physical sacrifice of whatever came out of his house. Okay, uh, we're going to open the, the help open our phones and, and, and entertain any questions, uh, but we will stop the um, we, we, will, we, will, we will stop the uh, recording, and uh, anyone uh, listening to the recording, if you have any further questions, get in touch with me, please. Get in touch with me and um, send me an email or uh, give me a call. If you have any questions, and we'll consider, be glad to answer your questions. We're going to stop the recording.